mic on? All right, John Defterius, thank you very much for that expertly led discussion there about the oil wells that rule the world, if we can simplify things. <laughs> uh, this is the conversation about how, uh, about the mines that rule the world. And uh, indeed, as John pointed out, it is uh, where things are moving. Uh, and of course, I'm delighted to be joined for this discussion by two of the key miners right now in the world, starting with Eduardo Bartolomeo, CEO, of course, of Vale, one of the world's largest miners. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Anna Cabral, uh, co-chair of Sigma Lithium, sixth largest lithium producer in the world and just getting started. So we're really privileged to have you here. So <clears throat> there are a lot of places uh, to start this conversation, but I think what we want to get into is base metals and the metals that are going to enable or build the energy transition. Uh, Eduardo, you uh, like to call base metals and the, and the metals necessary for the energy transition, you like to say that they're in a super cycle. Explain that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks, Ryan, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, actually, the, the, when, I, when I said super cycle for base metals or critical minerals, I was talking about the super cycle that was questioned on iron ore. Uh -huh. Iron ore went through a super cycle. Just to have an idea, uh, China used to produce in 2000, 100 million tons of steel. 2010, 600 million tons. Went from 100 to 600. And then to 1 billion tons. <laughs> and stabilized. That's the super cycle. Yeah. So when you ten, look ten, at the, Tenfold. Exactly. And when you look at the numbers that we just mentioned, or not the numbers, but the demand that is needed for EVs, turbines, uh, electrification, everything else, you see the famous critical minerals. Nickel is one of the obvious ones. Lithium from Anna is the, the, super, the super cycle because you see growth for copper. Copper is not seen as a critical mineral, for instance, in the US, yeah. by the way. That is awkward for me. But copper is growing 25%. Nickel is growing 100%. Lithium, I cannot talk about lithium, but lithium is talking 300 and something, eight times growth. So those minerals are really in a super cycle, different from iron ore. We see uh, another cycle in iron ore that we can talk later. It's around the high quality iron ore to do the famous green steel. And Anna, before I turn to you, I just yeah. got to ask this because we are in Saudi Arabia and you're doing a deal with Madin. Yeah, exactly. So where does that fit in for Vale? It's, uh, we, we are seen as a, how can I say, an iron ore company that operates in Brazil and sells to China. So I have both risks. I have risk China, we were talking later, earlier. Yeah. Oh, is China plateau, is China coming down? And people forget about the next two billion tons, two billion people that are gonna come to the world. So steel is gonna be needed, but people see Vale as a yield stock. Yes. When, we, when, we, when we look at what we had inside, one of the best assets in the world for nickel, for copper, for cobalt, we were being traded like iron ore that shouldn't be traded as it is, and we're having like this very nice asset undervalued. So what we did, we ring fenced the business, we covered it out, and we looked for a partner that had the same values that we have. And values, I'm not talking about only money, the values on time, on growth, on perception. And Manara is a uh, joint venture between uh, PIF and uh, Madden. We're, and, uh, we're very lucky because we see Middle East as the, the best place to do the, our other business that is the iron, the, the iron ore, the green steel, and we, we struck a deal with them. We just signed two months ago, and we're gonna close up to the first quarter, optimistically in the end of the year, but first quarter we're gonna sign, uh, we're gonna close the deal. Very interesting. So Anna, you heard there uh, this idea that uh, these base metals are part of a super cycle, uh, and yet, you know, you look at the multiples that mining companies trade at, uh, you look at the prices, uh, the, the commodity prices, the prices of these metals on the market, and you know, they're, are not huge. So is the, are investors, is the market misunderstanding the opportunity in the energy transition in this space, the, in these metals for building the energy transition? Absolutely, because as Eduardo was saying, we're entering this super cycle of the energy transition. So something is amiss. If EV growth projections, battery capacity growth projections are to materialize in 2030, which is just, what, six years from now, yeah. which in mining time is tomorrow, <laughs> uh, really. Um, most of these metals will need to grow supply five times 
to make it so that these uh, EV factories, battery factories have feed, right? And so that's the conundrum. These are growth stocks, but they trade like dividend yield stocks. So cost of equity is very high. So what happens? Where will the long-term capital come from? Well, either long-term investors, which is the alignment of purpose. I mean, we run a fund, we deployed proprietary capital for six years, and here we are. We're the first large-scale lithium producer in five years, in that scale, right? Uh, scale, low cost, green. Now, alternatively, debt. But then the conversation begins, senior debt, subordinated debt. Larry Finke the, today said something very interesting, like the system has, the architecture of the system needs to change. Fortunately, we made it. We have lots of cash flow. We have access to debt. But when you think about cost of equity, it's just not there because these are growth stocks, but trade like dividend yield stocks. That's the conundrum. So much to talk about, and we have just eight minutes. Real quickly, explain this to me. So uh, base metals necessary, mining of base metals necessary for the energy transition. And yet, you know, in, in uh, many people's minds, they think about mining, this is unfashionable stuff. Energy transition, quite fashionable. Everybody likes it, sustainability. So how do you solve that problem? Well, that's the, that's the difficulty because there are four things that need to come into play into building a resilient business in critical materials. Uh, speed. See, our client has changed. We're no longer servicing base metal, no, the base industry. We're servicing the technology industry. Battery companies are tech companies. EV companies are tech companies. So they demand speed. Uh, they want scale. The, the resilient businesses are large. I mean, his business, my business, we're very, very large. From the get-go, we just started. We're the sixth largest. Two years from now, we'll be the third largest. Um, low cost, because the batteries need to cost less than $100 a kilowatt hour. That's the magic number. So that we have massive adoption. EVs need to eventually reach parity because subsidies need to come to an end. And then you need to make these businesses environmentally and socially sustainable, sustainably, sustainable, because you need shared prosperity, otherwise your communities don't let you operate. So four things that do not talk to each other. And it's highly underestimated the challenge to build these enterprises from zero. We did it, but it's an enormous challenge. And that's, that's the conundrum the world needs to solve. Very interesting. So. You mentioned the word you know, batteries and battery production, and I feel like you can't have this conversation without talking about geopolitics, or I had a panel on earlier today, geoeconomics, the idea of using economic power and your resources for your uh, political or geopolitical aims. Yeah. This is something we appear to be seeing. You have, on the one hand, the United States restricting technology to China. China, on the other hand, beginning to place, put the put the paperwork in place, I guess, if we put it that way, for restrictions on the export of critical minerals. Very, you know, where I come from in the United States, a lot of people are very concerned about supply chain and the stability of the supply chain, reliability of the supply chain going in to the energy transition. What if these minerals aren't produced, for example, in the United States, if you take a U.S. perspective, and not processed in the United States, as is almost always the case? It's a huge issue now. People talk about it. Should we be concerned about it? Yeah. Look, um, going back to the deal that we just struck with uh, Manara, yeah. I think what attracted them and us, by the way, first of all, to have the speed that Anna mentioned that we don't have in a big company that is focused on iron ore. That's first of all. Second is that there's a three, like Anna got like the four, is the carbon footprint that the consumer will demand. There is the responsible sourcing. And then later, uh, the location. And we have a very uh, peculiar uh, position to be. We are, we are Brazilian-born company. We, we are in the South. We understand, we have the flexibility to, to run different worlds. We, we are, our main supplier is China. And of course, we do operate in Indonesia. But at the same time, I'm in an OCD country that I have main, my, my main operations is Canada. And that's, I think, going back to why, why this long-term value was perceived in this business. Because it matches the three. And one very important third element is the geopolitics, is, is the location. 
is the French shoring, is the onshoring, and that's why we're here in Saudi Arabia, by the way. We have a, we have a project on steel, on green steel, with uh, Balvu and Aranco. We're a supplier for them. We have another one with another client of us. We have the concept of mega, mega hubs. They are designed exactly to spread and diversify our risks around the world. Middle East is the future of the, the steel. The steel is here already. The future of steel is here in the Middle East because of direct reduction. You have, of course, China, but, but at the same time, I can play the both, uh, the, the both worlds, the North and the South. And I think, yes, it is critical. It is valued in this sense. But again, I'm going to echo Anna for long-term investors. Market equity markets are not seeing that. Yeah. Oh, boy, we only have three and a half minutes, and I think we're... <laughs> we got a lot more ground to cover, but okay, fine. So you mentioned steel and the importance of steel. Well, how important really is steel? You think about your business. You talked about how Vale produces 25% of the world's uh, iron ore, which goes into making the steel. Yeah. You talked about how you ring fenced the, the the base metal business, did the deal with Mod uh, doing the deal with Modin. Iron ore. Is there still? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, growth in, in demand for steel, for example, has, has been declining in China. Is that still like an interesting area to be in? Does the world still need all this iron ore yeah. and steel? I think the, from the discussions we have been here in, uh, in the forum, I think the global south has to develop. I think China is a, is a benchmark of what happened. When I mentioned that 100, 600 billion is, infra is infrastructure and property is real estate, they urbanized 400 million people. They removed 400 million people from poverty. So when you look Southeast Asia, when you look Africa, you look even Brazil, Latin America, those places are going to need steel. Steel is a proxy for GDP. When but making the... steel is, uh, to use an unpopular term, you know, it's a hard to abate, it is true. Yeah. It's a dirty business, huge emissions. And, that's, and then for us specifically, come a second opportunity. Yes, it will, it will be needed for sure, we have uh -huh. zero doubt about the need for steel, and will be needed in a greener way. When I said that Middle East does the green, is, is moving from the gray to green. We do today natural gas. We use natural gas in the Middle East to produce steel. It's, six, it's 0.6 tons uh, or, or carbon against 2 kilos, 2.6 kilos per ton for carbon and 0.6, 2, point, 2 point, uh, kilos in a normal blast furnace way. So. Of course, there's an opportunity for high-quality iron ore, because for direct reduction, high-quality iron ore, the ones that we produce, almost 90% of our portfolio is needed. So we have a base that supports the demand, and we're going to play in a segment here on the high-quality. That will be future, the future green steel. Anna, we only have a minute left to go. What, is, uh, what does the audience in this room need to know that they don't understand yet about base metals and about the metals necessary for the energy transition? Well, it's hard. So there's a disconnect between the time it takes to build a battery factory and the time it takes to build a metals and mining operation. And that gap needs to be bridged because otherwise we're never gonna get to the energy transition. So I think this is the collective challenge, right? And we need to do so in an inclusive and environmentally sustainable way, which is an added higher bar. We did that, but it was incredibly hard. So how do we keep on doing more sigmas? The world will need 30 sigmas, 34 to be precise, to make it to 2030. That's a lot. In the next six uh, years. Which is now tomorrow, right? right? There should be 34 companies today where I was, you know, six years ago, and there aren't. So how do we solve this? So that is the big question. Right? And what's the answer? We've well, got 15 seconds. <laughs> that is the question, exactly. So. All right. Well, that was a very quick tour of the metals and mining business and the importance of mining going forward in the future. Anna, uh, Eduardo, thank you thank so you. much. I hope you all learned a lot. I certainly did. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, cool. That was very good.